Harvesters, and welcome to all who have joined us for worship service today. At Harvest Community Church, we are a community of worshipers committed to Christ, commissioned to serve, and called to pray without ceasing. In Luke eleven thirteen, it says, If you then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. We want to encourage you to stay connected at this time and participate in our weekly Zoom Bible study classes. I hope you enjoy the worship service today. Goodbye. Hey, what's up Harvesters? This is Reverend Ron. I just wanted to take a brief moment to jump on to share a, a real quick word of exhortation and comfort during this unprecedented time that we are having in our nation. And so um, I want to uh, read a passage of scripture that is found in the book of Hebrews, and it is found in verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, um, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so from this particular passage, the, the author of Hebrews is exhorting us, he's exhorting you and I, not to allow ourselves to become distracted. We're living again in, in, in unprecedented times, and we're constantly bombarded with things on the news regarding the coronavirus, we're always getting updates. But in the midst of doing all the practical things that we're supposed to do, let us not lose sight of the importance of keeping our eyes on Jesus. Because if we're not careful, we will become distracted. And when we become distracted, it is easy for us to become fearful. So let us not lose sight of this important reality that we need to keep 
our eyes focus on Jesus. Let us keep the main thing, the main thing, and, uh, and let us, again, not allow ourselves to be consumed with the reality that we are facing right now. But as this word says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Some of your translators may say, looking on to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so with that harvest, uh, be encouraged, stay sober and stay vigilant, do the things that you need to do, but most importantly, stay in the word of God and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this time of, of encouragement. I thank you for my Harvest family. And I pray, Father, that in the midst of doing everything that they need to do to keep themselves safe, I pray that they will stay in the word of God and keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. Love you, Harvest. Look forward to being with you again soon. Hello, Harvesters. My name is Katherine Davis, and my favorite scripture is the 23rd Psalm. The first verse said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that means He watches over us wherever we go, whatever we do, wherever we are, and that we can always count on Him with 100% confidence that he's going to guide us and lead us in the right direction if we allow him to. I thank you, be safe, and God bless you. Hello Harvest, this is Minister Karen. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Today I want to share with you just some excerpts from uh, my favorite psalm, which is Psalm 46. And I'm just going to give you just a little bit of it. And it says that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And that means that he's not going to be here. He's here. So he's here now, very present to help you. Not your help is on the way. Your help is here. And then it goes on to say, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed and carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And well, look at the world. Look at what's going on. Isn't it doing that, so to speak? And yet, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And then it goes on to say that the heathen raged. Well, aren't they? The kingdoms were moved, but he uttered his voice and the earth melted. And that says that no one can hold a candle to our God. He's our strength in the face of our enemies. And then he goes on even to say, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, and I will be exalted in the earth. And then it goes on to say, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So when the earth starts being removed and getting carried into the midst of the sea, when the waters of your life get troubled, though the mountains shake in your life, say it with an attitude. And let the enemy know that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And you all have a blessed day keeping that Psalm 46 in your hearts. Amen. Amen. Hey, Harvest. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, can't wait to see everybody when we get back together again. My favorite Bible verse is Colossians 3.23, and it reads, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord, rather than for men. And what this means to me is that anything that I do, whether it is washing clothes, washing dishes, driving to the grocery store, getting groceries, doing my job, anything that I do, I need to make sure that I'm doing it 
as unto the Lord, that He is watching me in everything that I do. And that really helps me to get through some things that I think I don't feel like doing or I don't want to do. I just remember that I'm doing those things for Him and not for anybody else. Thanks a lot. I hope to see you soon. Bye. Oh,
Well, greetings, Harvest family and friends. This is Pastor Mike Jones of Harvest Community Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where we are a community of worshipers committed to Christ, commissioned to serve, and called to pray without ceasing. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and His mercy endures forever. Well, let's get right into the Word of God today. So if you have your Bibles, Open them up to Mark chapter 2, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. 
And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when he had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes uh, were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word today. We ask that you would speak to us through your word so that we might see Jesus. And in seeing Jesus, we might believe on him and believing on him, we might be saved. This is our prayer in Jesus name. Won't you say amen, amen and amen. I don't know about you, but this happens to me at least once a week. At least once a week, I'm looking for one of these things. This is a charger for my phone. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a charger for my phone and it has a, a little micro USB port right here. And there are some chargers that won't fit my phone, but this fits my Android phone just fine. You know, sometimes I'm very careless and I'll let my phone get down to 10%, 5%. And all of a sudden in the middle of a conversation with somebody, I'll have to immediately tell them, listen, you have to wait for me to call you back. My battery just went dead. My battery went dead and I'll have to call you back. You know, what happens then is that the conversation stops. The fellowship stops. The enjoyment of being with someone I'd like to converse with is all gone. It could be that we're talking about business or we're talking about ministry or we're talking about something important that's on the mind of the other person or that we have to share. It's, it's a terrible thing when your battery runs out. Well, I think that for many of us, our spiritual battery is running out. We've got a pandemic to worry about. We've got school starting up. We've got masks to wear. We've got to be safe. We've got to wash our hands. There's economic uncertainty. We've got an election coming up. The Democrats are mad at the Republicans. The Republicans are mad at the Democrats and everybody's mad at the pandemic. And so it could be that you've neglected to, to, to plug in to that spiritual resource that'll give you the kind of life that you, you, you know, it's a sad thing to run out of power. For the next few minutes, I'd like to talk on the subject. Jesus gives us power for living. Jesus gives us power for living. And men and women, the gospel is not for those who are simply outside of church and have sin to deal with. No, the gospel is for all of us. It was a very wise theologian who said, I preach the gospel to myself every day because every day I forget it. And so for the next few minutes, I want to talk on the subject, seven ways that Jesus gives us power for living. Seven ways that Jesus gives us power for living. And it could be that we need a recharge. It could be that we need to make sure that that we are, are, are operating at full strength. It could be that we need to plug in to Jesus to make sure our lives are right. And so uh, let's just look for a minute at the seven things, seven ways that Jesus gives us power for living. So I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction so you'll know where I'm going with this. We're going to look at the entire chapter because there are stories in the chapter of Jesus giving life into situations. And there might be a situation that specifically meets your need. You know, when we talk about following and walking with Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus, one of the primary ways is to put yourself in the text. 
So when he's talking to someone, as we read a story of Jesus, you just make sure that when Jesus is talking to that individual, that he's talking to you. You put yourself in the text. And so put yourself in the text today as we go through the entire chapter. So the first story is the story that we've read. There's a paralytic man. He can't walk and Jesus is meeting in a home and four of his friends bring him to meet Jesus. There's so many people in the house that they have to cut a hole in the roof and drop the man down to see Jesus. Well, the story says that Jesus, having seen their faith, says to the man, your sins are forgiven. There are scribes and Pharisees that are around. They hear Jesus say that, and they're curious in their hearts, thinking, this man blasphemies. He's uh, saying that he forgives sins. Does not God alone forgive sins? And Jesus, perceiving what is in their hearts, he says to them, which is easier, to say, rise, take up your pallet and walk, or to say your sins are forgiven, but just so that you'll know the Son of Man is who he says he is, I'll do both. So Jesus says, rise, take up your pallet and walk. And so there was a visual expression, a visible expression of an inward work of Jesus Christ. And so the first two ways in which Jesus gives us life is, number one, he forgives our sin, and number two, he heals us. He gives us complete healing. He forgives our sin and he heals us completely. I could be talking to somebody today who's been racked by your own sin. You've been feeling guilty. You've been feeling uh, alone. You've been feeling by yourself. You've been feeling like uh, uh, no one loves you. You've been feeling condemned. You've been feeling guilty. You've been feeling all of those things. And the same way Jesus knew what this man needed, he put his finger on the root of this man's problem. Jesus wants to put his finger on the root of your problem and my problem. And he starts off with, with saying, your sins are forgiven. Men and women, that is so important today. Because we live in a culture where we've forgotten about sin. Everybody's okay. People don't want to be convicted of sin. People don't want to be told that, that hey, there, there's some things about what you think and what you say and what you do that are not right. We ignore uh, our sin. We pretend like it doesn't exist or we explain it away. Jesus said to the man, having probably known that, that his, his, his root problem was spiritual, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. Listen, there are no sweeter words than Romans chapter 8 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no sweeter words than if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Men and women, one of the ways in which Jesus gives us life is he forgives our sin. Maybe we need to plug into that today. And then number two, he heals us. There is a physical and a spiritual healing that works together that becomes complete healing. I know that many of us have ailments that have a spiritual root cause. Many of us are suffering uh, because of our disobedience. Many of us are suffering because of bad habits and hang-ups and, and issues that we have in our lives. And these are inseparable. That God wants to forgive us our sin and God wants to give us complete healing. Number three. Number three is found in the next text, verses 13 through 17. And it's the story of Jesus walking by the tax collector's booth and seeing a man named Levi and telling Levi, come and follow me. Levi leaves the tax collector's booth and begins to follow Jesus. Men and women, that simple call transformed Levi's life. And the third thing that I believe a way in which God gives us uh, life is he transforms us. We're not what we used to be when we come to Jesus. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. He wants to transform us. 
He wants to shape us and mold us into the image of his son. He wants to transform us. And, and, and Matthew, his name is Levi here, but if you were to look in the, the gospel of Matthew, as it depicts the same story, he mentions his name Matthew. Because some uh, historians believe that Jesus changed his name. Matthew actually means gift of God. Levi or Matthew was transformed by Jesus's call. But not only that, if we were to read the same incident in the Gospel of Matthew, we know that Matthew, after coming to know Jesus and following Jesus, he throws a reception at his home for a group of sinners and tax collectors, and Mark mentions it here. And Jesus is eating with them and talking with them, and some scribes and Pharisees start grumbling amongst themselves, saying, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? Well, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The fourth thing is that Jesus is an available physician. Jesus is an available physician. He not only diagnoses our situation, but he gives us what we need and he pays the bill. He is a perfect physician. He is a physician that knows exactly what we need. Now look at this. The context is a man named Matthew who was a tax collector who was a Jew. The Jews considered him a, a Jewish sellout, a sellout to the Romans. They considered him a traitor. They considered him a Roman collaborator. They considered him an outcast. He was not even, Jewish tax collectors weren't even allowed to go into the synagogue. So he was deemed unclean. He was deemed as someone who was outside the grace of God. And men and women, I am so glad. I am so glad that Jesus touches the unclean because I am unclean. I am unclean. I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. There are things that I've said, things that I've done, things that I've thought that are outside the will and the way of God. I need a savior. I need a redeemer. I need a deliverer in my life. And so I'm so glad that Jesus is in the transforming business. Not only did Matthew decide to start following Jesus, but Matthew became an apostle and Matthew wrote a gospel that we read today. Matthew's life was transformed. The great physician saw what Matthew needed and he went to work in healing him. He did surgery on his soul and decided that he would transform his life. It could be that I'm talking to someone out there. You don't like the direction your life is going. You don't like the hurts, habits, and hangups that you have. You don't like the issues that you face. You don't like your, your personality. You don't like the way you think and the way you feel. God says, I want to transform you. I want to transform your mind. I want to transform your heart. I want to transform your life. I want to do a work in you that only I can do. See, Jesus wants to be that power source. It could be that we're not experiencing that kind of transformed life because we're not plugged in. We're not plugged in. We need the power source. We don't have any power in and of ourselves. My phone can't charge itself. No, it's got to be plugged in. But then there's point number five. Point number five deals with a situation where the disciples of John and the, the, the disciples of the Pharisees were fasting. Then Jesus came to, Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, why do the disciples of John fast and why do the Pharisees fast? Why don't we fast? And in verse 19, Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. And men and women, what Jesus is saying is, point number five, Jesus brings joy. You see, fasting was a very well-known practice. It was a spiritual discipline amongst the Jews. But fasting was not a pleasurable experience. Yes, it would get you closer to God. Yes, it would discipline your soul and calibrate your will so that you might do a better job of obeying God's commandments. But it certainly wasn't pleasurable. And Jesus gives an example of him being a bridegroom. 
Him being a groom preparing to be married. Well, when you get prepared to be married, that is a time of great joy and celebration. And your friends come around you and celebrate with you. And anyone in Jewish culture that was ready to be married was also ready for a great wedding feast where there would be eating and celebration and dancing and drinking and hilarity. And what Jesus is saying is the bridegroom is in your presence. And so it's a great time of joy. Stop being so somber. Stop being so sad. There's going to be a time for fasting, but the time for fasting is not now. The time for fasting is have joy because the day of the Lord is here. Your Savior has arrived. He has come and he is me. And so Jesus gives this illustration of being the bridegroom. And he says, how can the friends of the bridegroom fast now? There's going to be a time for fasting. Now, men and women, let me ask you a question. Do you have joy in your Christian life? If you don't have joy, it could be that you're not plugged in. It could be that you're, you've drained yourself of power. But men and women, the scriptures say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The scriptures say rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The scriptures say that joy is an integral part of the Christian life. And if you don't have joy as a Christian, it could be that you're not plugged in because joy is a fruit of the spirit. Men and women, we've got to have joy. One of the things that God wants to give us, what Jesus wants to give us is joy. He brings joy. He says, I'm the bridegroom. And so there ought to be joy. There's a wedding feast about to happen. But point number six, not only that, but, but uh, he goes on to give two other illustrations. He says that in verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and tears, the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wineskins burst the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but the new wine must be put into new wineskins. The other way that Jesus gives us life is that he makes all things new. He gives us a new way of thinking. He gives us a new way of feeling. He gives us a new way of doing. He gives us a new spirit. He gives us a new life. John 10.10 10 says, I came that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. Jesus wants to give us new life. Jesus wants to give us his life. Jesus gives us this illustration of saying, I did not come to reform the old. I came to make something brand new. You don't put a new piece of cloth on an old piece of cloth and, and expect it to work well. The, the, the cloth will have a worse tear than the one you had before. You can't patch it up with that. Nor do you put new wine into old wineskins. A wineskin was a piece of leather that was like a, co a container for wine. I if it was aged, that leather would get brittle. And if you put the new wine into an old wineskin, it would burst the wineskin because that new wine would be fermenting. It would have gases and it would expand. So what you do is you put new wine into new wineskins. Because he is saying it's new. I didn't come to reform Judaism. I didn't come to make a better Judaism. No, I came to establish something brand new. That's why we have an old covenant and a new covenant. An Old Testament and a New Testament. It is a something brand new, this relationship with me. And so God wants to give us new life. Everything is new. Can I give you a word about this pandemic Stop being upset about all the things that are changing. Change. This change is just bringing about something new. There's going to be a new way of doing school. There's going to be a new way of doing work. There's going to be a new way of doing family time. There's going to be a new way of interacting. There's going to new way, be a new way of doing church. And there's going to be a new way of doing ministry. Yes, we, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's not what we expected. Yes, it's not what we planned for. It may not even be what we want, but it's new. It's new. And Jesus says, I make all things new. You Pharisees and you scribes keep trying to put me into a box, but it's new. Point number seven, and we'll be done. 
Look at uh, the, the, the verses toward the end of the chapter. And in verse 24, the Pharisees say, Look, why do your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus' disciples were eating the heads of, of the wheat in the fields. And that wasn't necessarily a problem, but they were doing it on the Sabbath. And the scribes and, got, and the Pharisees got upset because they were breaking Sabbath law. The Jews had about 39 different Sabbath laws that they have developed based on that one command that says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But they kept adding laws and adding laws and adding laws. You, you, there was only a certain distance you could travel. You couldn't uh, 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 do business transactions on the Sabbath. There were so many things that you could not do on the Sabbath thinking that they were making it holy by adding laws. Well, point number seven is Jesus gives us freedom from religion. Freedom from religion. Let me say this, and I want to be real clear, that Jesus is not concerned about religion. He's not concerned about you practicing religion. He is concerned about you pursuing relationship with him. He's concerned about you confessing your sin and confessing your need, confessing your emptiness and allowing him to fill you. He's concerned about you confessing the fact that uh, we are sin sick and we need a physician and he wants to be that physician for you. He's, 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 he's concerned about you coming to him by all means necessary and bring your friends with you. So that he might say, I forgive you of your sins. Rise, take up your issues and walk. Men and women, God wants to do a work in our lives. He wants to give us life. He wants to be the power source for our living. But we got to be plugged in. The same way my phone won't work without a charge, our lives won't work without Jesus. If you are here today, and you've been convicted. You're not plugged in to the life of Christ. You have not been trusting him. You could be a Christian, but you're not plugged in. You could be a, a churchgoer, but you've never really plugged in. I want to give you the opportunity now to plug in to Jesus. To say, yes, I need that power. I, I'm empty. I need that charge. And I need it continually. I need the, the truth of God's word, the gospel, over and over again in my life. And that simple truth is that I am more sinful than I can ever imagine. But through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, I'm more loved than I can ever believe. And when he died on that cross and rose from the dead, his spirit now invites me to have relationship with him. I can actually invite Jesus Christ into my life through the power of his Holy Spirit and his spirit will reside in me. His Spirit will begin to slowly help me think differently, help me say differently, help me do differently, help me feel differently as I learn about Him, as I walk with Him, as I trust Him for every detail of my life. Jesus gives us power for living. If you'd like to make that commitment, let's pray. And this will close our time. Father God, if there's someone under the sound of my voice that does not feel plugged in. They don't feel plugged into the life of Jesus Christ, but they know about Jesus. They know that He forgives. They know that He heals. They know that He gives new life and transforms. They know He's a great physician. They know, Father God, that He makes everything new. And they know, Father, that His desire is relationship and not religion. If you want that relationship... Simply pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I now open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, please let us know. We would love to give you a little bit more information. But until next week, Remember Jesus will continue on in our series. God bless you. Amen and amen. We are home.